insufferably pompous and punishably tedious, long-winded, self-aggrandizing, and kings among kindred. There is no shame in bending the knee to one such as myself, so pay your fucking tribute before I lose my temper. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Masquerade Monday and a new lore video about everyone's favorite blue bloods, the Ventru, the second in my series on vampire clans. While other clans have skulked about their petty intrigues, the Ventru have curried favor with Caesar, whispered into the ear of Charlemagne, bankrolled the Age of Exploration, and even swayed policy in the Holy See. Theirs is a legacy of leadership, from Ventru fledglings starting their climb to the top, to the mightiest elders whose influence spans the world, and long have they played kingmaker in the shadows of the mortals. The Ventru bear heavy criticism from other clans, but heavy hangs the head who wears the crown, right? At least that's what they tell themselves. The Ventru have long been one of the proudest lines of vampires, and its members work hard to maintain a reputation for honor, genteel behavior, and leadership, even if its most magnificent leaders occasionally succumb to tyranny and blood rage. They not only consider themselves the oldest clan, but the Ventru see themselves as the enforcers of tradition and the rightful leaders of kindred society. The Ventru cherish history arguably more so than any other clan, believing it to be a worthy guide to live by and to justify their positions of authority in modern knights. This is not to say that they have any particular obsession with the truth, a myth can be much more powerful than the real thing, but they take history very seriously, a fact that is no doubt aided by their tales of conquest and grand achievements. The Ventru claim to fame begins in the early days of vampire history, with Cain himself, the subject of an upcoming lore video. Cain commanded his eldest child, Enosh, to embrace the Ventru founder Ventru. He was Cain's advisor in the first city, and when Cain prepared to leave, he chose Ventru to bear the burden of stewardship. Through this story, whether fully factual or not, the Ventru justify their position of superiority and leadership over the other clans. The first major achievement of the Ventru is the creation of the militant city-state of Sparta, founded by a Ventru named Artemis, who made herself Sparta's patron goddess. The Spartans would soon become the perfect example of mortal potential in the eyes of the Ventru, loyal, brave, and completely devoted to self-perfection. The growing power of Sparta and the Bruja in Athens led to the first Bruja War, which Kine would call the Peloponnesian War. I made a lore video all about the Bruja, which you can watch here. The aftermath of Sparta's victory led many Bruja to regard the Ventru as power-mad barbarians, while the Ventru considered the Bruja dangerous ideologists. After Sparta's fall, the rise of Rome signaled one of the clan's greatest ages, with the Ventru, Colat, becoming the city's first prince. Colat did not seek to rule the Romans directly or make himself a deity as vampires in the past had done, but influenced events from behind the scenes, ruling through ghoul proxies that delivered favors and contacts. This allowed Colat to grow rich and powerful while the mortals remained ignorant. This strategy would be widely adopted in the centuries to follow and would serve the Ventru well once the Masquerade was adopted. The Second Bruja War between Rome and Carthage, where vampire clans such as the Bruja and Banu Hakim ruled mortals openly as gods, would be a great victory for the Ventru and other vampires of Rome. The war began when a Bruja named Dominic antagonized the Malkavian Alcius. The Ventru Toreador Malkavian and Gangrel fought alongside the Romans against the people and vampires of Carthage. In the end, Rome prevailed, and the Bruja would never forgive them. In the years that followed, Rome prospered, and the Ventru shared its power with many of the other clans that had taken part in the Second Bruja War against Carthage, establishing friendly relations with other Canaanites, all thriving for several centuries. But when Rome fell, most of the Ventru abandoned the ruined city to establish new centers of power elsewhere. During the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, the Ventru began infiltrating existing governments as feudal lords, thus taking credit for the creation and expansion of the medieval feudal system. As the Frankish state expanded into Germany and Italy, the Ventru began to prosper once again. When the Holy Roman Empire was dispersed, the Ventru moved their center of power to Italy. However, since Rome was dominated by the La Sombra and the Catholic Church, the Ventru established themselves elsewhere in Italy, such as Venice, Milan, Genoa, and Firenze. Here, the Ventru constantly opposed the La Sombra in their quest for power. Posing as kings and merchant princes, the Ventru expanded their influence from the Mediterranean through trade routes and crusades, thus becoming again a force to be reckoned with. During these times, many Ventru were influenced by the laws of chivalry and personal honor, and some of these separated themselves from the main clan during the founding of the Camarilla and turned 
return to the Sabbat. I made videos on both of these factions, which you can watch here. The Victorian age was a good time to be a Ventru. The combination of centuries-old feudalism served to keep the Ventru at the top of the power structure. From there, they could oversee both international politics and the finances of an entire country. Many Ventru childer, already hungry for territories of their own, were sent to colonies throughout the British Empire, creating Camarilla positions in India, Australia, and Egypt. The vampires who already occupied these regions faced years of vicious propaganda declaring them to be heathen, savages, and warriors. Most people, both kindred and kind, adopted these views, making the work of controlling popular opinion that much easier for the Ventru. Not all Ventru were misanthropes, but enough of them were to make vampiric opinion turn against them for the first time since the founding of the Camarilla. The Toreador were repulsed by the Ventru obsession with money and political gains. The Tremere had more important things to worry about than who was prince of a small English town, and the Gangrel were treated as servants and animals when they were not being hunted down. The Ventru made just enough compromises to smooth things over, at least with any kindred whom they could make use of, and it was during this time that the Ventru learned to temper their cutthroat business dealings with an outward veneer of philanthropy. They remained, of course, a clan out for profit and prestige, but there is no reason not to remain civil while doing so. This policy was put to the test in the New World, where the Ventru spread west across North America and provided much of the impetus for doing so. The clan's money could sponsor quite a few land-staking ventures and mines on the west coast, and wherever cities sprang up, so did Ventru interests. The years following the World Wars have seen the Ventru reassert itself once more. The clan thrived during the Cold War, taking full advantage of the paranoia on both sides to make massive profits and sink its teeth into the growing bureaucracies that came to dominate governments. Ventru on both sides of the Iron Curtain worked in tandem, watching their respective governments act against one another for the greatest advantage. The Ventru were particularly fond of the secret police that came into existence, finding them an excellent way to keep the kind in in line and under supervision. In the West, the Ventru concentrated on the recovering European industries, all but abandoning the last of their feudal and noble ties, for big business and majority shares in multinational corporations. When the Cold War ended, the few former communist bloc Ventru who did manage to cultivate some degree of influence found themselves stripped of power just as the governments they supported had been. A decade later, these Ventru are still trying to recover, while Western Ventru-owned companies stepped into the economy and invested heavily in national infrastructures. As a result, a number of Ventru in the East, particularly in Slavic countries, have turned to organized crime as a new field of influence. In modern nights, the Ventru are a synthesis of the modern and the ancient, often in stark contrast within the clan and amongst each other. Theirs is money of old, but their young manipulate stock markets and influence currencies. But for all their wealth, their distinguished history, and their status among kindred, each and every Ventru must still seek that one resource that makes kindred society egalitarian, precious blood. Ventru have exacting and rarefied tastes, even when it comes to blood, and they find only one specific type of mortal blood palatable and vital for them. This refined palate may be very narrow or very broad, say the blood of younger sisters, or young men, or even children. A Ventru will not feed on any other blood type, not even if they are starving or under duress. The Ventru are extremely organized, and take pride in the fact that every other clan member has a place and knows just where they stand within the clan and in relation to everyone else. The organization of the Ventru is localized and feudal, with various universally understood peerages, vassalages, oaths of fealty, and sworn boons taking the place of a rigid hierarchy. Many Ventru style themselves as secret masters of their domains, consolidating their power in long-standing networks. The Ventru greatly value propriety and honor, and use many forms of address and respect. Their laws of decorum are complex and rigid, and could fill several large volumes. Almost every Ventru can recite their lineage at least back to the Elders, if not to the Great Methuselahs. In Ventru society, one does not necessarily ascend a ladder of advancement from rank to rank. Rather, members can move through the largely honorific system as their abilities and fortunes dictate. The Ventru feel that this system allows them more flexibility and lets them spot new talents within the clan and reward it if so desired. The clan elders often point this facet of the system out to young kindred who are anxious and frustrated at their own lackluster success. Listen, Ventru, and listen well. I need someone I can depend on. Someone who, if they serve me well, will go very far. Do as I ask, and you will know my appreciation. 
Refuse me, and you will never rise above the rank of foot soldier. Understood? The system borrows heavily from the Roman Republic's political institutions, and although the democratic elements of that system were stripped away long ago, the overall structure and some of the names remain. The clan is headed by the Ephorate, which arbitrates clan disputes, chooses the representative for the inner circle of the Camarilla, and maintains the unity of the clan in the face of global issues. Other influential figures within the clan are the Strategoi, who enforce the dominance of the Ephorate. Agents of the Strategoi are the Lictors, who often specialize in a specific field such as finances or warfare. On a more local scale, the Tribune acts as a messenger to a Ventru in a political position, often to alert them of the directives set by the Ephorate. And inside cities, the Ventru organize themselves into an institution called the Board. This council effectively adjudicates Ventru concerns within the city, over seeing venture business and political interests within a domain. The board is officially headed by the Praetor, who brings issues before the rest of the board and hosts their meetings. Below the Praetors are the Aedils, who aid the council and Praetor just as supervisors assist managers in a business. Questors act as assistants for Elder Ventru, and finally below the Questors lie the Common Ventru, without a formal title or useful experience to the clan. They are called Irin. Venture within the Camarilla tend to find the idea of divergent lineages distasteful, but there are a few examples of variants within the Ventru clan. The El Hijazi are a distinctive lineage of Ventru, and unlike the main body of the clan, who are traditionally associated with the Romans or Christian Europeans, the El Hijazi bloodline claims descent from native Arabian lineages. They have adopted Islam and are relatively few in number, but still wield considerable political, financial, and even religious power in the Arabian Peninsula. However, they don't have any particular differences from more mainstream Ventru that would qualify them as their own bloodline. The Sabat Ventru are the knights and paladins of the Sabat, sworn to combat the antediluvians and bring down the degenerate Camarilla. They have assumed the roles of the saviors of the Canaanites and believe mortals to be ignorant cattle sufficiently only for food and service, like nearly all Sabat followers. They see their Camarilla counterparts as failures, deficient in honor and disgraced. Oh, and speaking of the Camarilla, you hear the Ventru tell it, the very idea of the Camarilla originated with them. Every other clan, with some exceptions of course, realized what an invaluable proposition it was and flocked to their banner. While the El Hijazi and the Sabat Ventru are clan variants, they only qualify as bloodlines in the loosest sense. The Danava are much more of a bloodline, differing markedly from the base clan. Centered around the Indian subcontinent and serving as sages and priests, the Danava are among the most respected vampires within the caste system of the Indian kindred. The origin of the Danava is a mystery, with some claiming to be descendants of the primal goddess Danu, and see the Ventru as the errant bloodline, rather than the Ventru as a parent clan to the Danava. Whatever the truth, they are all still Ventru. Ventru culture places a heavy emphasis on dignitas, the Latin word for dignity, but in modern nights, it is often described as face. Ventru are completely aware of the unsavory aspects of power, and while a Ventru leader is just as likely to lead organized crime as he is a Fortune 500 company, he must always conduct himself with dignity, grace, and honor, at least publicly. Consider it a lesson. You see, we Ventru sometimes must take it upon ourselves to patronize the rabble, and hear them out with a look of genuine concern no matter how ridiculous their notions may be. Venture take assaults on their character very seriously. Spreading rumors, taking credit for another's work, or just insulting a Venture are a few of the ways one can diminish another Venture's face. Doing so is a sure way to make an enemy, and it is cause for severe punishment or discipline if proven. As the products of noble upbringing, class, and culture, the Ventru place great importance on gentility, and Ventru etiquette can become quite complex. For the Ventru, politeness means more than just carrying on with traditional ways and means. It serves some very important functions, especially when it comes to making sure that individual clan members can overcome their petty personal differences and respect the social structure. By nature, kindred are prone to holding grudges and overreacting to insults. Add in the average Ventru's regard for their face, and politeness becomes not only a matter of manners, but a matter of survival. Interacting with one another in a sophisticated and polite, albeit somewhat distant manner, helps alleviate the threat of flaring tempers. 
As a clan devoted to proud detail and tradition, the Ventru have managed to accumulate a very large code of conduct, including everything from what color clothing to wear at board meetings to what kinds of presents to give at celebrations. The Ventru favor conservative clothing and reserved presentation unless they're making a point about power or money. Ventru princes may wear a circlet or carry a scepter as symbols of their office, while young bluebloods display their own achievement via suits, ties, dresses, and accessories that are all easily overlooked but add up to a stunning total effect. In the same vein, a Ventrue's haven displays both their great power and distinguished tastes. Opulent, grandiose, even Baroque, these all may apply to Ventrue havens. They shun the gaudy displays of other kindred, and their style tends less to the avant-garde than it does to the classical and traditional. To the Ventrue, a well-maintained haven is an extension of oneself, and for someone to see it in a less than flawless state implies weakness, distraction, or even madness. According to their own oral history and annals, the Ventru have embraced only those worthy of the honor. Nobles, religious leaders, and great military men have all found their way into Clan Ventru over the centuries. The Ventru have high standards of admittance into their ultra-exclusive club. Anyone who has made something of themselves may attract the attention of the Ventru, who judge their childer based on their prominence and success even before they start to groom them for the embrace. Socialites, moneyed families, corporate wunderkinds, military leaders, and even untested newcomers who show great promise are keenly valued among the Bluebloods. Neonates who fail to meet the clan's standards find themselves shunned, left out of important opportunities, and otherwise disadvantaged. Many would-be sires discuss their potential childer with their elders, often their own sires, before the embrace, thus gauging the new Ventru's likely or unlikely acceptance into proper society. Even after the embrace, the fledgling has to pass a training regimen known as the Agoge in order to be accepted as a full clan member. They must learn the ins and outs of Ventru etiquette and traditions quickly, all while learning to master their potential and discover their place within the Camarilla and kindred society. The Agoge demands that the sire tests his child constantly, quizzing him on facts and understanding, teaching them more as they assimilate previous knowledge. Failure or missteps during this regimen results in insults and even physical punishment. When the Ventru is deemed acceptable by their sire, they are introduced officially before the Prince of the Domain. After another period of training, the young Ventru is groomed to introduce themselves before the board. And to do this, in order to prove their worth, the sire poses a challenge to the neonate. The young kindred must go forth on their own and establish a domain of influence somewhere within the city and without the assistance of any other Ventru. If the neonate succeeds, they are taken before the assembled board members of the local Ventru. They then give a full account counting of themselves, clan traditions, history, and how they met the final challenge. The Praetor then asks the neonate a series of ritual questions, and in answering them, the neonate also recites their lineage and promises to uphold the traditions of both the clan and the Camarilla. The assembled board then votes on whether the neonate should be accepted into the clan, either agreeing or disagreeing to the kindred's acceptance unanimously. According to Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition, these are the Ventru's opinions on the other clans and factions. Useful only so long as they don't become a poison in our veins. When you learn of them in your domain, do not hesitate to introduce them to their master, the Sun. Who would guess that kindred so simple could be so groundlessly prideful? Our stillborn siblings, who never developed a sense of right and wrong, or what not to stick your cock into. Pretenders to our mantle of dignity and honor, though they are formidable. When you find yourself making excuses for them, it is time for the purge to begin. Surprisingly functional, should you be able to handle their odious personalities and overestimation of their own value. No kingdom survives by mingling with the conquered. They can prove dauntless allies or treacherous enemies, often both within the same skin, so let them know who commands. What more do you need than their cloying scent of corruption to know that theirs is an ill presence? Just admit you're beaten, and this will become much more pleasant. It is our greatest triumph, but also our greatest responsibility. The inmates run that asylum. There's something admirable in what they do, yet how they do it is entirely puerile. Now I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about the Ventru? Did you play as one in Bloodlines 1? Did you learn anything new about them in this video? What lore video do you want to see from me next? 
I make videos multiple times a week and every Monday is Masquerade Monday, so if you enjoy what I do, please consider hitting that subscribe button. A huge shout out to Ian Watson, aka Fun Aether, for his help with compiling the info for this video and for offering insight into Vampire the Masquerade lore. Thank you so very much for watching, it means the absolute world to me, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!